Hey everybody, welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder with my husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. We just want to say thank you to all of our listeners. If you are here on podcast, please leave us a review. Please subscribe. It helps us out so much. And if you are watching on YouTube, please don't forget to turn the notifications on so you can get a notification every single time we upload a new video. Also, a quick reminder about our Patreon. We upload extra bonus episodes on there every single month. And so if you are interested in that, just visit Murder With My Husband Patreon and you can sign up. And we actually might be uploading a surprise episode on Patreon. So stay tuned. Yep. So stay tuned. Okay. So Garrett, for your 10 seconds today, I actually had someone write in and suggest that you answer a question. Ooh, okay. So I'm surprising (laughs) him with this. This is on the spot. But Judith Lonsberry on Instagram asked, I love it when Peyton tells the story, but your, your fresh perspective from your husband is awesome. I do have one question. What is Garrett's favorite podcast that you two have made to date and why? Ooh, good question. So what episode do you feel like was your favorite or sticks out to you? So if I were to pick one, I'm not 100% sure, but I guess any survivor story just kind of sticks with me. Yeah. So I don't think I can pick one. I think they stick with all of us. We get a lot. Yeah. But maybe the more like survivor ones we do, maybe I'll have one that's a favorite. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, it was. Thank you. This case was suggested by one of our listeners. And on the new way we do case suggestions, we have a little thing that says, like, what's your information if you want credit for it? And um, I think she got a little confused. She just wrote, heck yes. And so she did want credit, except for those are anonymous. So unless you leave me your name, I don't know what it is. <laughs> That's but funny. the story suggestion was good. And so please, if this was you this suggested this story, please, please message me so that I can give you actual credit because... I'm all for the heck yes, except for I don't know your name, (laughs) which I just cracked up. So our case sources are a 48 hours episode, season 28, episode 18 called Dangerous Games, dailymotion.com, cbsnews.com, patch.com, and metrowestdailynews.com. Our story this week takes place in Dover, New Hampshire. 19-year-old Elizabeth Marriott, who goes by Lizzie, has just entered the University of New Hampshire as a sophomore. It was the fall of 2012, and Lizzie was hoping to study the marine biology program, and it was a pretty big deal at UNH, and so she was beyond excited. I guess the the marine biology program there is is pretty good. So she had moved out of her parents' home, whose names are Bob and Melissa Marriott, and into her aunt and uncle's home, whose names are Tony and Becky Hanna, which was closer to UNH. And so she just moved in with her aunt and uncle to save money from living in student housing. She loved her friends. She was outgoing. And more than anything, she loved animals. Lizzie had been volunteering at the New England Aquarium just before leaving for college. On Tuesday, October 9th, 2012, Lizzie left her aunt and uncle a letter at home that said she was going to a friend's house that night and would be home no later than 12 or 1230. By the next morning, Lizzie hadn't come home. Her aunt and uncle are skeptical, but don't want to budge too much into her life. She is a young adult after all at college, and if she wanted to stay too late at a friend's house and crash there for the night... That's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until Thursday morning when there was still no sign of Lizzie, not even her car, that her aunt and uncle truly began to panic. So they decide to call Bob and Melissa Marriott, Lizzie's parents, to see if they had heard from their daughter who was staying with Tony and Becky. When Tony called Bob, he said, have you heard from Lizzie? We haven't seen her for a couple days. We're just getting a little worried. And Lizzie's father, Bob, replied, no, we were actually just about to call you guys because we haven't heard from her. Uh Uh-oh, okay. Lizzie's parents are sick to their stomachs. Like, is there a checklist that you should do when your daughter is Mm -hmm. suspected to be missing? They lived a couple hours away in Massachusetts, so they decided to call police to report Lizzie missing, meanwhile making the drive to where Lizzie was last seen. I feel like we've been doing a couple of these missing ones lately, and it's just... Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Like, I can't imagine that feeling. Of, like, we haven't heard or seen her. Mm-hmm. In the car, they also call anyone and everyone that they can think of that could help, but they really don't get that, you know, they don't get very far. Okay. But the problem is neither her parents nor her aunt and uncle knew what friend Lizzie had left to go see that Tuesday night. 
on the note. She said, we're going to see a friend. Okay. No one knew what friend it was. But back at the police station, investigators had been immediately working the case. And they quickly found out through friends who Lizzie was supposed to go see that night. So everyone's actually, I guess, investigating the case. They're not like, oh, she could have just run away. Yes, they immediately okay. investigate, even though That's she's good. a young adult. Because last week that was completely different. Not the different. case, uh -huh. yeah. They find out that Lizzie, the friend she was going to see, was a young girl by the name of Kat McDonough. The friend who told police this information was named Nate McNeil. He worked at the local Target with Lizzie and Kat. Okay. So Lizzie worked at Target. She went to go see Kat that night. And Nate is the friend who said, oh, they were going to hang out because at work, we all work at Target together. They said uh, okay. they were going to got hang it, out. It. Nate was one of Lizzie's new friends in New Hampshire. And he says that Lizzie was always happy and searched for the best in everyone. He claims that Lizzie had an aura about her that made people want to talk to her, that she was super special. Nate tells police that when Lizzie hadn't been answering his texts and then he found out that she had been missing, he texted Kat to ask if she had seen Lizzie since they hung out on Tuesday. Why would Nate be texting her? Kat? Yeah. Oh, just texting Lizzie in general? Yes. Because they were friends. They're just because they're good yeah. friends? Mm -hmm. okay. They worked together. They were friends. They talked okay. pretty frequently. Keep in mind, she just moved here, so it's not like she has a ton of so friends. So they weren't like boyfriend and girlfriend no. or anything? Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. Kat text Nate back and is like, yeah, Nate, actually, we were supposed to hang out on Tuesday, but Lizzie never showed mm -hmm. to hang out. And so I too am worried about Lizzie. And Kat also says, yeah, you know, police called me and I told them that Lizzie was missing and everything that happened and that she never showed up for when we were supposed to hang out and that's it. So now Kat and Nate had actually known each other for a long time. So they worked at Target together, but that's not how they met. They grew up together. Kat was actually one of Nate's sister's friends all the way back from kindergarten. Oh, okay. So they knew each other for a long time. And then Lizzie kind of came into the mix in 2012. As investigators are piecing all of this information together as well, they learn that Kat McDonough lived with her boyfriend, Seth Mazilia. And Kat and Seth had met in the summer of 2011, so just a year earlier, and they both were involved in the local theater scene. Okay. And so, side note, when I was little, I wanted to be an actress and a singer so bad. I knew I was going to be famous, which I'm not. But I literally could have sworn <laughs> I was going to be famous because I was going to be an actress or a singer. And so, yeah, I never took theater class. That's though. funny. Did you take theater class? In high school, it was one of the electives. Oh, so, so you, did you so act did. in a play? No. Oh, you just took class. I just, I kind of just did whatever needed to be done to oh, pass the class. Oh, you were a class. stage manager. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you were back there pulling up the props. We actually had to do like, like for our final project, we actually had to like act in front of. Oh, in front of everyone? In front of everyone. Is that awkward? I don't know. It was fine, I guess. Eight-year-old me would have ate it up. Yeah. High school me, never. It was awkward because I uh, I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but I think I had to, you had to do it by yourself on stage. Oh. You had to like talk to yourself. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I bet you were good at it. Thanks, babe. So um, they are in the local theater scene together. You can actually watch both Kat and Seth's audition for the local play. And we will play those on our YouTube video. But that's just kind of funny to see them like auditioning. And mm -hmm. we're not talking high school. They're both out of high school. This is like there's like a local theater yes. in in town. They actually they know act. what they're doing. Yes, yes. director tells police that shortly after meeting Kat and Seth began hanging out a lot so they meet after both getting a, a role in this play and then they begin hanging out a lot but Seth was 29 and Kat was only 17 okay so almost immediately after turning 18 Kat moved in with Seth and cut off all contact with her family 
Mm. So her parents obviously disapprove of this. And this is like a really bad sign of an abusive relationship. If you like just are you're young, they're old, you completely move, you shut off everyone else in your other life and you everything is about this person. Yeah. And so the play director was like a little worried. He's like, this just doesn't seem right. But Seth worked at, at a local electronics store as well as teaching martial arts and was actually a trained EMT. So he just, he had made his rounds by yeah, 29. Yeah, seriously. As police are looking into Seth, thinking that maybe Lizzie had made her way over to Kat's house where Seth lived as well, despite what Kat had texted Nate, and maybe Seth was home and something had happened to Lizzie there. While looking into this, they discover that Seth had had a dark side. Seth's name, when mm. run, popped up on many sex and bondage sites. So BDM seemed to be a huge part of Seth's life. Most of his online activity revolved around it. So when you mean pop up, you mean he was acting or doing things no, or he just, was just searching? on a whole bunch of sites, groups, um, Got it. like okay. pages about this. Okay. So while researching, police also discovered that Kat had become involved in this online scene as well since they started dating. She was posting pictures of herself with scream names like Vampire Actress and Miss Scarlet. So they were definitely into this to mm -hmm. this to the scene together. And it's safe to say that Seth and Kat together as a couple were experimenting in bondage and submissiveness and had been looking around on websites posting that they were interested in bringing a third person into their relationship. This kind of reminds me of wow, maybe I am remembering some of these, but yeah. the other case we did, mm -hmm. what was that? You know what I'm talking yes, about, episode correct? 30 that's the sydney mm -hmm. loof case very similar was. a boyfriend and a girlfriend but they were in like a cult yes Correct. yes well more. he's kind of started a he cult. he kind of started a cult okay. but yeah and they would like try to get other women to come in and so this couple is just looking for a third person to be involved in their relationship got it so just three days after lizzie disappeared police brought in both seth and kat placed them in separate rooms and interviewed them this is pretty fast work on the department side. Granted, I know it's their job, but I do find it easy to kind of pick apart like police in these mm -hmm. cases because you're just like, there's more they could have done. They didn't do this they, like last week. And sometimes like last week, they deserve it. So on the flip side, I will also acknowledge when they do a good job, which these people three days after she went missing brought in Seth and Kat and were like, hey, something's not adding up. What's going on? Yeah. So in there, in the interview with Kat, Police are told the same thing that Nate was by Kat, that Lizzie and her had made plans to hang out together Tuesday night. In fact, they had already hung out once before, but Lizzie never came that night. And then the next thing she knew, Lizzie was missing. What year is this again? 2012. Okay. I know I always ask this. Was there no cameras by the apartment complex or we just, mm -mm. okay. No, but there are cell phones. They all yeah. have cell phones. Mm -hmm. Around the two hour mark of Kat's interview, Kat's like, I'm done ask answering questions. So she stops answering questions. So police are like, okay, well, you're free to go. I mean, she hadn't admitted to anything. She's not under arrest. But instead of leaving the police department, she sits in the front of the station and waits for Seth to be done with his interview as well. Okay. But unbeknownst to Kat, Seth was going to be a little while because while he was in his interview he was telling a completely different story about what happened Tuesday night. At no way. Yeah. So Seth's interview would last around 11 hours. And in there, he would disclose to police that Lizzie had, in fact, made it to their apartment on Tuesday night. So Kat was lying. He tells them that there was sex involved and then something went wrong and Lizzie died. Very similar to the last, to, to Sydney Luce's case. Wow. Seth tells interrogators that when Lizzie died, he panicked and brought her body to Pierce Island where he dumped her in the water. And this is a place, Pierce Island is a place where a river meets the Atlantic Ocean. So the water is rough. It's running. Police immediately send a search team to the body of water, but they find nothing. The search for Lizzie Marriott had now turned into the search for Lizzie Marriott's body. Okay. On Saturday morning, just five days after Lizzie Marriott had been had last been seen alive, Seth Mazalia was arrested and charged with her murder. Media hears about the search and arrest, and Lizzie's parents are brought in by law enforcement to be told the news. Was Kat not arrested for anything? Nope. 
So I literally, my next paragraph says, I know you are all asking about Kat's involvement yeah. and what exactly Seth told police in his initial interview, but the interrogation files are sealed. So we don't know what exactly he said. And police really didn't let out much information, probably because they got a confession. So they don't really need the public's help to like, oh, this is what we know. Can anyone uh -huh. help us? So everyone's confused because Seth was arrested, right? And Kat wasn't, except for Seth and Kat were at the apartment together. And he said that sex was involved. So, yes. I mean, I assume Kat was there. Yes. So was Seth truly alone that night? Like, did Kat leave and he was alone? Or did he just cover for Kat? We don't know. Okay. And so we'll never know? We will. Oh. So <laughs> you were like, <gasps> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nate actually ended up texting his coworker, Kat, after Seth's arrest, who he's known his whole life, and says, like, are you ignorant as to what happened? Or, like, did you know and not do anything? Like, can you imagine as a friend yeah. being like, I texted you about her, and you said, oh, she never showed up, and now your boyfriend's getting arrested for her, like, kidnapping and murder? Especially because Kat and him have been friends yeah, for so long. Yeah, they've known each other for a long time. He's probably like, I don't even know who, who she is. Yeah. Kat never replies to okay. Nate's message. Police begin searching Kat and Seth's apartment and apartment building, and they discover evidence in the dumpster behind the building. Men's underwear, a pair of gloves, and Lizzie's sweatshirt. The search for Lizzie's body lasted for weeks, but nothing was ever found. This is truly heartbreaking for Lizzie's parents because they feel like their daughter is just in the ocean somewhere mm -hmm. and someone threw her in there like trash and now they can't find her. Oh, that's horrible. And I think something that we can't fathom or comprehend until it happens to us would be how hard it is to go through something as horrible as your daughter getting kidnapped and murdered and then never finding the body. Yeah, The body is all they have left really and they don't even have that. I assume it's one of the biggest types of like, closure. Yes, or yes. And it's like, it might. I don't think we can understand how mm -hmm. hard this would be for Lizzie's parents because we're like, well, you know, it's okay. And it's like, to them, it's like, that's all we have to hold yeah. on to. And we don't have it. Yep. And so I just, I feel bad. But after Seth's arrest, a woman named Catherine comes forward who claims that she dated Seth while he was in college and she was in high school. So Seth apparently has a habit of dating a lot younger teenage girls yeah. than him. And she says that while they dated, he was obsessed with murder, violence, and he was also very abusive that he didn't respect hard limits when it came to BDSM, she would say stop and he would push farther, which from what I understand is not how BDSM is supposed to work. Like okay. there's supposed to be very clear cut communication. Like a safe word. Yes, about what's accepted and what's not. And that's how BDSM properly works. Catherine tells police that in 2002, her and Seth moved to New Hampshire leaving her family where he was also trying to bring another woman into their relationship. He had secluded her from everyone in her life and she grew scared of him. She moved out eventually, went into hiding. And then not wow. even 10 years later, Seth's arrested for murder with an 18 year old girlfriend coming to his defense. She went to hiding. Yes. Because she was scared that he was going to murder her, her. Yeah. Or hurt her. Yeah. And so she comes forward and is like, it's totally him. Yeah. Like I was that 18 year old girl until I got out. Just two days after Seth's arrest, Kat meets with his lawyers to try to help him out. She looks wildly different than the first version of Kat that we saw in like after when she was first brought you have in a picture? by police. Yes. So the pictures will be up on our YouTube channel. Okay. So if you want to go check those out, but they also will be up on our social media. So this is Kat when everything happens. Okay. And this is Kat when she comes in. No way. Yeah. To defend him in front of his lawyers to try to help him out on his team. That is not the same person. And now typically we wouldn't know much about what Kat told his lawyers. Wow. But due to what happens later in the case, this footage and information was released. Okay. So Kat before the arrest was young, spunky, unique. And when she shows up for the interview with Seth's lawyers, she's reserved, has glasses, soft looking, like two completely different yep. types. She admits to his lawyers this time that Lizzie did actually come over that night. 
And they all played cards and watched movies, which eventually led to consensual sexual activities between the three of them. She says that they started getting a little more intense and that Lizzie eventually agreed to be tied up in a harness. Okay. She says that Kat herself tied Lizzie up and it was the first time she had actually tied a harness on someone else. She had harness tied herself before, but not someone else. And she tells Seth lawyers that Lizzie eventually had a seizure, suffocated and died. What? Yes. And just like, I think she's randomly saying from the way the harness was tied. Okay. That it was an accident. She Holy even crap. gets down in the video on her knees to show the lawyer what position like everyone was in when this happened. And it does seem a little detached the way Kat is talking about the event of someone dying like not even a week ago. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I think she's solely here to save her boyfriend not to like confess to the the accident with with Lizzie, and she's not here because she feels bad about what happened. To I'm Lizzie. wondering if she's just trying to make up more of a story, or if this is what happened. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Lizzie's friends and family do not think that this version of events that Cat told the lawyers is what actually happened. Okay. They do not think that Lizzie would have willingly agreed to be tied up, especially with people she had only hung out with once before. Nate even tells police that Lizzie actually had a girlfriend named okay. Brittany that she was really happy with. And so he's like, I really don't think she would have even done any consensual sexual activity with these guys because she was like in a committed relation, monogamous relationship. Okay. So it would be two months before Kat McDonough would be arrested in this whole situation, but not for murder, for hindering the investigation. And she's also ordered to, ordered to not talk to Seth again. So what exactly do you mean hindering? Does that mean prolonging the investigation? I think lie, coming in in the interview and lying about the fact that Kat had come over. Okay. And also not calling police and saying, hey... Something bad happened. Got it. Because police do not have Lizzie's body, the case will be tougher. It just is. It's really hard to try a murder case without a body. They need Kat's testimony. They need her to turn on Seth instead of having his back. And for Kat, this is a difference between 20 years in prison and three years in prison. It doesn't matter how strong you think your love is. It ain't a 17-year difference in prison type of love. That's a huge difference. And so Kat agrees to turn on Seth. Sure, I'll say whatever I need to be given a smaller sentence, which is why she's not arrested for murder. She's arrested for hindering the investigation. Is that real though? Like that was really a three year to 20 year difference? Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so in May of 2014, two years after Lizzie's murder, Seth goes on trial. And at trial, Seth is saying, no, I didn't do it. So even though he said it was an accident and something happened, he's now at trial going, no, I had no part in it. The state relies on Kat's testimony against Seth, which is now a different story once again. So we heard the first story of, no, Lizzie never made it to my house. We heard the second story of, actually, she did make it to my house. And then we were all, I tied her up and something went wrong. Well, because it's two years later. Yes, two years later. Why? Why? Why do we have to wait so long, I guess? Do you know? So, yeah, so... To go to trial, to take a case to trial where someone is pleading not guilty to what they're being tried for, it takes years and years for it to actually get there because the state is building their case, the defense team is building their case, and to go to trial, you have to agree like, okay, we're ready to go. Like we've we've done all the investigating we can because essentially when like the defense goes to trial, they are building a case against the state's case. Well, I'm sure that was part of the defense's strategy would be my guess to prolong as much as you can. Oh, sometimes to it is. Everything. And sometimes it's not, which is hard because everyone has the right to a speedy trial. You've heard uh -huh. of that before. Yep. So sometimes they'll be like, the state doesn't have a very good case. So we're going to take it right now. And their case is going to fall apart. Got it. Or sometimes they'll prolong it and try to just appeal appeal push back another date another date we are actually seeing that with the mixing the missing rexburg kids uh -huh. the daybell case they are finding every reason they can to be to like well before we start back. let's do this before we start let's do this and they have the right that's your right okay so as long as you have good lawyers who can figure it out then yeah it's possible so yes it is two years after and this time the prosecution states that cat was under control of seth 
and in fear of her life. Kat gets on stand and tells the jurors that Seth planned and murdered Lizzie while she stood by. So this time she gets up and says, nope, Seth had planned it and I was just in the room. She claims that she got tricked into her relationship with Seth and was told by him that she needed to choose someone to bring over for Seth to torture. Kat says this was the sole reason she reached Holy out to crap. Lizzie. And that Lizzie showed up and they all agreed to play strip poker. Kat says the lights were dim and Kat was naked and Lizzie was only in her underwear. What a psycho that he wanted to just torture somebody. Yeah. Seth then suggested that Kat and Lizzie kiss. So they're playing strip poker. This is all according to Kat's testimony. So she's changed her story once again. This is the new story. They're all playing strip poker. And then Seth says, hey, Kat and Lizzie, you two should kiss. But Lizzie's like, no, I'm in a committed relationship. Like we're monogamous. I'm not into that. Mm -hmm. And so Seth's like, again, well, maybe Lizzie, you and I can have sex while Kat watches us. And she's like, no, I'm in a committed relationship. I don't want to do yeah. that. Kat said, and then Seth just left the room. And Kat was like, he was mad, but me and Lizzie just kept hanging out. And then Seth left and put on gloves and grabbed a rope and came back behind Lizzie and put the rope around her neck and started strangling her. No way. After this, Lizzie was unconscious and dying and Seth raped her. And Kat said that she just sat there silent and watched. What? Kat breaks down on the stand when talking about this, which is to me kind of weird considering that years earlier when the wounds were still fresh, she acted like she didn't really care about what was happening. Mm -hmm. But also she could have had battered win women's syndrome. Like she could have just been solely Froze. there. Yeah. To like defend him, not even realizing what had happened was bad. But now it's been two years and she's realizing like the extent of what had happened. I just so confused why... Someone, Seth, goes, I just want to kill somebody. I know. I don't understand. After this, at trial, a woman named Roberta Gherkin was brought onto the stand who claimed to be a friend of Seth and Lizzie's. She testifies that she got a weird call at 1049 p.m. the night of Lizzie's murder. And it was from Kat and she was asking her to come over. So Roberta grabbed her boyfriend, Paul Hickok, and drove to Seth and Kat's apartment. She says when they walked in, there was a body on the floor by the bed. Seth told them that he went too far this time. And they say that Kat was in the kitchen against the cabinets in a fetal position. So the state brings this witness in to confirm the fact that Kat had no part in the murder. So they were basically, because I was going to say, why didn't they come forth earlier? But they were kind of holding out on purpose. The state was holding out on Correct. purpose. Yes. These two people just didn't come forward. Really? Yes. They say that they eventually just left the apartment not wanting to get involved and they didn't call the police. Kat claims that to, after this together, they put Lizzie's body in Seth's car. And Kat is saying while she's doing this, like, I was doing bad things. Like, everything I'm about to tell you is bad. Like, I was doing bad things, but I didn't murder her. And so they put Lizzie's body it, together in actually Lizzie's car. And they drove 13 miles to the coast. They parked and got Lizzie, who was wrapped in a tarp and put into a suitcase. They took her out of the suitcase. They dumped her body off the cliff. Now, this part's really bad, so if you don't want to hear it, fast forward. They dump her body off the cliff, but it's low tide, and so she didn't land in the water. Oh, my gosh. And so Kat has to climb down the cliff and get Lizzie's body and move her into the water after they just threw her off Why the cliff. Why did Kat have to do this? Because Seth said he was tired. That's according to Kat. Okay. They go back into Lizzie's car. They abandon it in a parking lot and they walk six miles back to their home. The defense argues that Kat is a liar and that she was actually the cause of the death. Like she said the first time in or the second confession to mm -hmm. his lawyers. So this is why that confession to his lawyers gets leaked is because by the time they go to trial, they are no longer on the same team. So now they have this, this video of her backing up their defendant and now they're using it against her at trial, which is why we saw access to it. But I think the other couple that came forth and said, this is what happened, probably sealed the deal. 
Yes. And so the defense is like, Kat's the aggressor. Seth just helped get rid of the body. Basically just flip flopping mm-hmm. the stories. So two days after deliberation on June 27th, 2014, the jury agrees on a verdict. Seth Mazilia is found guilty of first degree murder by strangulation, guilty of first degree rape and murder, and guilty of two counts of conspiracy. So the jury says that the premeditation came in. So for first degree murder, it has to be premeditated, right? You had to have planned it. And they say that they were able to agree on premeditation because of the gloves that he went and put on. They were like, why conceal your identity if you didn't know that you were going to go out there Mm -hmm. and kill her? And so that's what sealed the deal for the jury. Lizzie's parents don't think that Kat would have done this without Seth, but they do think that Seth would have done this without Kat. Which I could see, I think. Yeah, and so they think the results are fair. Like mm-hmm. they think it's okay that Kat wasn't charged with more because they think that she was just got involved with the wrong guy who led her to do the wrong things. So seven weeks later, on August 14th, 2014, after Lizzie's parents give their statements and Seth stands up and says once again that he did not murder Lizzie, he is sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Lizzie's parents haven't been to the beach since Lizzie died. They can't look at the water. Uh, Yeah. There is a memorial in the woods for Lizzie. No grave because they don't have her body. Mm Mm-hmm. And in memory of Lizzie, her family has set up a scholarship in her memory called the Lizzie Marriott Ocean Explorer Fund. Kat was released on July 15th, 2016 wow. after serving her sentence. And in December of 2016, Seth was denied a new trial after appealing on the fact that they didn't mention Lizzie's sexual past at his first trial. Good. I'm glad he was denied. And it was actually taken pretty high. Really? So he tried to appeal and was like, her sexual past should have been released at trial because it would have made me look less bad. Mm-hmm. And people were like, maybe. And so then they took it higher and higher. And then they were like, no, you no, killed somebody. you killed someone. Yeah. We're not giving you a new trial because of this. And so then he was denied. Okay. So yeah, he's still in prison. Good. But yeah, that is the case Man. of Lizzie Marriott. That just blows my mind that. I mean, he planned it. He totally planned oh. to kill someone. No and doubt about I, it. The glove thing didn't stand out to me mm-hmm. until they said the jurors. St- and I was kind of like, dang it, Peyton, why didn't you like see that? Like but he I'm literally, like, it's true. Yeah, he went back, grabbed some gloves. He and, planned it out. Yeah. And it's hard. I think a lot of uh, something that's like up in the air about this case is how much is on Kat's plate mm-hmm. for what happened, you know? And it's like. She probably was abused. We know she was cut off from her family. We know that she was probably not choosing to do any of this stuff. But at the same time, you're a bystander, right? Yep. And so that that is kind of what's hard. So she did serve time. Mm-hmm. And then also that couple who didn't call the police, they never like got in trouble from what I could find. I don't know if they legally could have though well, yeah you you knew what happened you oh, hindered an investigation that's true. too yeah that's true like you are equally as culpable as cat if you saw the dead body and didn't report i'm guessing it. they cut a deal where they said look we'll come if forward you testify which yes. is probably what happened mm-hmm. but it's just kind of like ugh, yeah you know like that was a really bad decision uh-huh. to not come forward because they didn't want to get involved and then yeah. Not get, you know, just basically get. I'm glad he's caught it. though. I am too, because yeah. I, and his ex-girlfriend said, she's like, if it wouldn't have been Lizzie, it, it would have been, been someone another else. girl. Like he was always going to do this. It just, it just was sadly Lizzie. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to see the footage and images that go along with this case, you can visit our social media. It's Murder With My Husband on Instagram and Facebook. Please keep sharing. Please leave a review. It seriously helps us out so much. We are so grateful that you guys are here. And actually, I did want to say that when we started this podcast, I at least did not think that we would grow a community like we have Mm -hmm. and i'm not saying we're huge but i'm just saying that this community is active they're present like and growing and growing and i just it's crazy to me like i really did not i did this because it was i like enjoy telling these stories and i thought maybe my friends and family would listen like 50 people yeah but now we just have all of you guys and so i can't thank you enough for letting 
us do this and then also i just wanted to thank you for sitting here and listening to stories that you absolutely hate don't even but you do it for all of us who want this no pain's the true hero here don't don't, no don't you guys are the true hero not me i'm just here telling stories and i wouldn't be doing it if it weren't for you guys so i just want to say thank you for being here and we will see you guys next week with another episode i love it and i hate it goodbye Thank you.